Pa, you are an investment banker. Well, I don't think there's any call for insults or name calling. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I was just... In uh, is, after all, a very difficult situation. Well, uh, uh, no, but let's face it, you are an investment banker, and I, I just wanted to get your view of the turmoil that is now engulfing the financial world. Well, you know, I'm of a certain age. There are not many of us left in my generation. And I can look back at a time when the world seemed a, a simpler place with uh, some sense of certainty and order. I think of it as a, as a golden age of banking. You're thinking of the 60s, perhaps, or, or even the 50s? And now I was thinking more of June last year. <laughs> Why can't we go back to a time when people took the word of a banker as gospel, you know? Now when you get getting suspicion, finger-pointing, everybody asking all sorts of... All sorts of difficult questions. Uh, what, what sort of questions? Oh, well, yeah, I don't you know, the sort of nitpicking, pointless things like, um, well, I don't know, you know, where's the money gone? <laughs> As if I'm supposed to know. <laughs> but it's generally thought that it is people like you who are responsible for this uh, crisis. Yes, well, I think that's broadly true, yes. <laughs> yes, we've given far too much credit, we've been paid far too much, and we've been stupidly greedy. <laughs> and so, what are you going to do about it? I mean, where do you go from here? Well, I've given this a very great deal of thought. Mm. And um, what I've decided to do is to go on doing the same things as long as I possibly can. <laughs> Surely that's an extraordinarily irresponsible attitude. Well, yeah, you might say so, but I've considered all the options, and what seems to be the way it works is that I go along to the government and say, I'm sorry, but I've done something exceptionally foolish, which will cause enormous damage to the economy. And they say, have you? Oh, oh well, then, here's 15 billion pounds. <laughs> So, like nearly everybody else, you lost a great deal of money on uh, property and derivatives. A, a colossal amount of money. But, but there is a silver lining to it all, if you, if you look hard enough. Is there? <laughs> yes, luckily I lost other people's money and not my own. <laughs> That's something of a consolation. Yes, it must be. Uh, so, uh, you're all right, uh, personally. Well, you know, uh, over the last decade or so, it's been, it's been very up and down. Sometimes I've had good years. Sometimes I've had incredibly good years. <laughs> but with the best one in the world, it's impossible to spend the amounts I've earned, so I've still got quite a lot of it left. If other people had done what I did, they wouldn't be moaning about their food going up. Uh, yes, many people would say that it is those who can least afford it that will suffer most from your mistakes. Mm. Those with uh, mortgages and credit card debt and, uh, and the lower paid. Well, I think it shows extraordinary lack of gratitude by these people for what we've done. I mean, if it hadn't been for us, the City of London would be uh, just a, a, a pathetic backwater instead of the financial centre of the world. Now, think of the billions which flow into London every day, or used to. Think, think of the enormous amount of tax revenue that generates. But people like you hardly pay any tax. No, but think how much it would be if we did. <laughs> Uh, but haven't people in your world insisted on light regulation by the government and a generous tax regime? In 2002, uh, Gordon Brown cut the capital gains tax on business assets held for two years from 40% to 10%. 20, yes. If you were a partner in a private equity firm making millions out of deals, these millions would be taxed at 10%. Uh, in effect, uh, they will be paying income tax at 10%, while their office cleaners were paying 20%. Yes, as often said, but it's very simplistic. A lot of private equity partners weren't paying anything like 10%. <laughs> no? No. A lot of them were paying 5%. <laughs> Some of them were paying nothing. In 2006, there were 52 billionaires in this country. 32 of them didn't pay any income tax at all. Well, why did the government go along with this? Because the private equity firms went to them and threatened to move their businesses abroad. And the government said, please don't do that, we want you to stay here. If an office cleaner went to the government and threatened to go and clean an office in the Cayman Islands, the government would say, well, piss off then. <laughs> George Parr, as an investment banker, why are we so poor when last year we were so rich? Well, of course, I still am rich. <laughs>
Indeed. But I take your general point, partly it's to do with the business cycle. The business cycle. Now, how does that work? The market is a very sophisticated mechanism. Sometimes it goes up and sometimes it goes down. <laughs> when there's more greed than fear, it goes up. When there's more fear than greed, it goes down. <laughs> so you're saying the banks have been too greedy? Oh, no, 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 not at all. Not at all. The opposite is the case. The banks have always been noted for their public spiritedness, for having the interest of the poorest in mind. Have they? I must have missed that. Oh, no, certainly, certainly, certainly. Over the last uh, few years, the banks have been saying to themselves, we've lent all the money we can to people who've got some assets and some prospects. How can we start lending to people who haven't got any money or prospects or any hope of paying it back? The banks were being compassionate, were they? Oh, very, very much so, very much. And, of course, we can charge much higher interest to those sort of people. A commercial bank will go to one of their poorest customers, say, um, I don't know, a single mother who hasn't worked for five years, who's constantly going over her credit limit, who's behind on her credit card payments, who can't keep up the mortgage. And then somebody will ring her up and say, how would you like us to lend you the money for a new conservatory? <laughs> And what does she say? She says he's not sure about it. Why not? Because she lives on the tenth floor of a tower block. <laughs> <laughs> but the man at the bank goes on trying. And what you have to remember is these people are really desperate. The people in the tower block? No, the people at the bank. No. <laughs> they're, they're not paid very well, so they need their sales bonuses to make a decent living. So, so this woman gets a second mortgage. But isn't that terribly risky for the bank? Well, you'd think so, wouldn't you? And so would I, but then I'm not very good with figures. <laughs> but I have some very clever chaps working for me who are, and they found a way around this risk. They came up with what's called securitization. And uh, how does that work? It's absolute magic. <laughs> The first thing is, it's no good for the bank just to hold on to a mortgage on its own. All it means is that we get some pathetic dribble of interest every month for the next 30 years and does absolutely nothing for our bonuses. <laughs> you might not live that long. <laughs> That's slightly unnecessary, if I may. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, but, but you're right. So, so, so what we do is to take this mortgage, we put it together with lots of other mortgages and bits of debt, and pass it up into what is called a structured investment vehicle, or a collateralized debt obligation, and we sell it. Uh, the advantage of that being... Being uh, that we can book the whole lot straight away as a big profit, and that does wonders for our bonuses. And you don't have to wait 30 years for the money. Precisely. Uh, but a risky loan is still a, a risky loan, isn't it? Not if you pass it up with a lot of other loans and some other loans are of good quality. If you do that, the bad loans somehow get better. <laughs> All on their own? So, sort of all, all on their own, yes. I mean, we're in very deep waters here, mathematically. I mean, the, the people who devise these financial instruments are incredibly clever. You see, one of the things which makes loans risky when you mix them all up together is what is called correlation. If one very risky loan is put in with a lot of other loans which are very much the same, it increases the risk. Because if one goes bad, the others are very likely to. Exactly. So we had to be sure there was very little correlation in the loans in the CDO. Such as there being a lot of subprime loans to American house buyers with no chance of paying them back. Yeah, well, of course, it's easy to see that now. <laughs> but everybody in the market had confidence in absolutely, it. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, let me put it another way. Not everybody in the market had confidence in it. In fact, nobody did. The key thing is, we all behaved as if we did. <laughs> Didn't it worry you that you didn't understand these things, these CDOs or the formulas? Of course it didn't. In fact, it would have worried me if I had. <laughs> because if I could understand it, anybody could. <laughs> Not just the quantification experts who worked for me. And if anybody could, then anybody could make billions like me. And where would that leave us all? <laughs> so, the point is, you believed in these things. I believed in them, and more important, I believed that everybody else believed in them. I mean, it's like religious faith. You, you don't believe in the existence of God because it's obvious. You believe in it because it's mysterious. It passes our understanding. <laughs> well, certainly, these things passeth my understanding. In fact, it hurteth my mind just thinking about it. <laughs> Wouldn't it be better if there were some 
independent agencies which could help just set the price of these very complicated financial instruments? There are. There are. There are firms like Standard and Poor's and Moody's which put a credit rating on different forms of investment and get paid a fee. Well, who pays their fee? Whoever is selling the investment. <laughs> Isn't there a huge conflict of interest there? I mean, surely there's a massive temptation for fraud, mm. uh, giving a top credit rating to things which didn't deserve it. Well, certainly, when it came to these uh, things like CDOs and SIVs, the agencies consistently gave AAA ratings to what the Financial Times called grotesque risk monsters. <laughs> But I don't think fraud was involved. Well, why did they do it then? Well, the analysts who work for the credit rating agencies aren't very well paid. They get very small bonuses, so all the smart people left for the banks and the hedge funds. So, as the FT once again said, leaving second-rate employees to rate complex deals they didn't understand. So, uh, you're saying it wasn't criminal, it was stupidity. Stupidity and incompetence, that's all. <laughs> And that's something we can be very proud of. <laughs> what happened to the system where a, a banker actually got to know the person wanting a loan and made a judgment about how risky the loan was likely to be? Isn't that a better way of doing business? Oh, my goodness, no, all that went out with the ark. You can never make any serious money doing things like that. And the market's far too big. Have you ever heard of credit defaults? Whoops. Well, no, vaguely. Well, they're a very ingenious way of ensuring against companies defaulting on loans. At the end of 2006, the market in credit default swaps was $54 trillion. That's two-thirds the size of the total global economy. And the point of them is what? To decrease the risk of a crisis in financial markets. Well, did they work? No. <laughs> As it turned out, they actually increased the risk of a global financial crisis. So where did it all start to unwind? Mm. What happened? Uh, didn't you have any inkling that something was about to go terribly wrong? Well, what everybody thought was, uh, it didn't really matter if things went wrong, or if we made mistakes, or if people defaulted on their mortgages. Why not? Because property values would go on rising and all the mistakes would be cancelled out. <laughs> I've been working in the city for 40 years, and if I've learned nothing else, and I have learned nothing else. <laughs> it is there is an absolute rule that property values never go on rising forever. That's the rule. That's an is absolute it? rule. They never have and they never will. Only a complete idiot would think otherwise. Right. Except that just this once we thought they would. <laughs> But the American housing market began to collapse and that affected all those complex financial instruments, the CDOs and the SIVs. Indeed, sales of asset-backed CDOs fell from $227 billion last year to less than a billion this year. Well, why did it happen so suddenly? Because some idiot somewhere asked a question that should never have been asked. Which was what? Which was, how much are these things worth? <laughs> and then the whole thing unraveled. Yeah, it makes you weep, doesn't it? <laughs> If they'd have kept quiet, things might have just gone on as they were. Oh, for the good old days. Uh, as an investment banker, how do you think we're going to get through this crisis? Well, of course, it depends who you are. If you're holding a mortgage or if you're on middle to low income, then, of course, you're stuffed. <laughs> So, what's going to happen to you and to your bank? Uh, there's a rumour going around that you're going to be taken over by a Spanish bank. Yes, it's a possibility. It will be a very, very sad day. It will mean I have nothing to look forward to except a compensation payment of £12 million and a £5 million pension fund. <laughs> Isn't that rather a lot of money to pay someone who, after all, did so much damage to his company? We can all understand big rewards for success, but this, this is a reward for failure. Oh, no, no, it's not a reward for failure. It's compensation for failure. <laughs> and they probably think it's worth paying £12 million to stop me doing whatever I was doing to the company. So, why are Spanish banks in particular in a position to buy up other companies? I mean, earlier in the year, we saw Alliance and Leicester bought by Santander. Uh, didn't they lose money on these toxic financial products? No, the bloody Spanish bloody didn't, and for one very good reason. Spanish banks aren't allowed to hold CDOs or SIVs and things like that. It's against their law. So, I have one question. Why wasn't it against our law for British banks to hold them? 
If it had been, we wouldn't have lost all this money on them. It's very, very unfair. <laughs> so, you would approve of tighter regulation for the city? I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> Self-regulation is the answer. You mean there will be no more investment in CDOs and SIVs? Absolutely. We wouldn't touch them with a the barge bowl today. Although there are some things, some new things coming into the city which everybody's getting very enthusiastic about. You're not serious. What things? They're called re-remixes. <laughs> Re-remix. Re -re uh, yes, I, uh, I'm not making this up. Re-securitizations of real estate mortgage investment conduits. <laughs> Where you take a lot of mortgages, you chop them up, you put them into bonds and mix up the bonds and trade them. You see, o over $9.3 billion worth of re-remixes were created this year. But they sound just the same as CDUs. Oh, no, they're completely different. Well, <laughs> well, actually, they're nearly the same, but there are crucial differences. The mortgages won't be ones sold to people with no income. Well, that's a relief. Just to people who can't prove their income. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, it sounds as though you haven't learned any lessons at all. It sounds as though the whole merry-go-round will start again with people in the city and on Wall Street thinking they're going to make money out of nothing. Not at all, no. We know there's absolute rule in the city that you can't make money out of nothing. Never? Never, ever. Only a complete idiot would think otherwise. <laughs> Except? Except just this once. <laughs> We think we might.